All right, thanks, Andre. Good to see everybody. I recognize a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. I haven't been up here really since before the pandemic. I used to get up a couple times a year for SBE meetings. I'm like an hour away down in San Diego. Uh, but it's good to see everybody again. And I appreciate you guys having me. This is a sort of a dry run for a presentation that I'm gonna be given at HomebrewCon uh, two weeks from tomorrow. It'll be in the very first seminar session on Thursday morning at 10. So I was, for those of you, there's a handful of you that were at the Quaff meeting in March where I gave a prototype of this talk. At that March Quaff meeting, I would say the talk was kind of 40% of the way to what it's gonna be at HomebrewCon. And tonight it's about 80 to 90% of what is gonna be at HomebrewCon. And you'll see, I'll tell you, there's places in here where I'm still waiting on some data. I still need to run a few experiments that I'll plug in, but it's pretty close. I hope you guys enjoy it. One thing I would ask, because I'm also kind of using this to help me with my timing a little bit, because they're very strict on that for HomebrewCon. So I'm gonna periodically be glancing at my phone because I'm gonna start a stopwatch. But as far as questions are concerned, if we could save them to the end, it'll help me because then I won't have to sort of infer what the timing would have been if those questions hadn't come in. So if you have questions, remember I'm gonna answer every question in the room at the end. I just don't want it to sort of interfere with my uh, clock work in the meantime. All right, so I just hit start. This is mastering the mash. Control the process to produce the work. Now I've given you the big sell and now I'm about to tell you the whole thing is kind of a bait and switch because mastering the mash, it's sort of like medicine or law. You never really master it. No one ever says, oh, what do you do for a living? I master medicine. No, you practice medicine. You practice law. And really, you, as brewers, we all sort of practice mashing. But I want to hopefully give you guys a, a toolkit, some information that you can use to improve your practice of mashing. So who am I? There's me. Um, there's my son, John Quincy. Uh, a lot of you guys know me from Quaff. But tonight, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm the guy who just conducted 78 mashes over the course of 10 days. John Palmer says, the difference between a good brewer and a great brewer is his or her ability to control the brewing process. And I wouldn't have put that up on this slide unless I completely agreed with it. And we're gonna spend the next 50 minutes or so talking strictly about process. Recipe is super important, super fun, but I'm a firm believer that where you really learn how to excel as a brewer is by understanding sort of beneath the really high level what's going on with your brewing process. And if you improve something on your brewing process, all of a sudden, every single beer that you make gets better. It isn't like you made a tweak to your pale ale recipe and your pale ale gets better, but your other recipes all stay the same. You fix something on your mash, every single one of your beers is gonna be better. Here's our objectives. First, I'm gonna try to help you guys out with some basic knowledge about enzymatic conversion. There's gonna be some science. I'm gonna try to make it at the right depth so that it's hopefully approachable. And really what we wanna do with this is try to develop some intuition as to what's going on, the science behind mashing. Because if you have that intuition, if you understand what's going on beneath the hood, it'll help you troubleshoot, it'll help you make connections on your own. Next, we're gonna try to understand some process control points of single infusion masses. And when I say process control points, I mean the knobs that you can turn on your mash, the things that as brewers are all the variables that we can change to manipulate what's happening in the mash. So these are gonna include the primary ones that are available to us. First is crush, or how finely your grain is ground. Second, it's really two, but I put them together, time and temperature. These are the ones that most of us are the most familiar with, and they're probably, frankly, the most important. Third off is pH. Fourth is mash thickness, so your water to grain ratio. And then fifth is your grist composition. So this is what kind of malt you're using and in what proportions in your mash. And then lastly, Really, this is probably my primary objective with this seminar. I hope you learn a lot about mashing, but I also really hope that I strike a chord or inspire some of you guys to go and do some further exploration of mashing trials on your own, sort of like the 78 mashes that I just did. Now here's the tell them what you're gonna tell them part. 
First thing we're gonna do is cover the science. I've alluded to that already, the fundamentals of work and enzymatic conversion. Second thing is I'm gonna to present to you the homegrown experimental framework that I put together. It's really not rocket science, but I'll try to walk you through why I did what I did and how you could replicate it on your own. Next is gonna be, we're gonna talk through those five MASH process control points that I just alluded to. The theory and what the science says, how, how they influence the MASH. Then the data that I collected based on my trials uh, to see how they influence the mashes that I did. And then lastly, what are the implications for us as brewers? And finally, we'll wrap up with some takeaways and hopefully some more inspiration of things to explore. All right, so here's the science. This is the complicated part. If you make it through these next 10 or so minutes, you're gonna be on fast track through the rest of the seminar. Work composition. There's, not all sugars are created equally. So when we create a wort, what we're doing from grain to, to wort is we're converting starch into sugar. But when I say sugar, there are many different kinds of sugars. And the significance of that is that some of those sugars are more fermentable than others. Some of those sugars are fermentable by all brewer's yeast. Some of them are fermentable by certain strains or kinds of brewer's yeast. And some of them are not really fermentable at all. The main categories that we're going to be looking at uh, glucose and fructose, these are the simplest of sugars. It's one six carbon ring is a glucose molecule. And in a typical word, about 12% of your fermentable sugar is going to be glucose. This is the sugar that the yeast just goes right after immediately. It's the easiest thing for yeast to ferment. After that, you have sucrose or saccharose, as it used to be called. That's typically about f around 5%. These are approximates because it's going to depend on what, how you mash but about 5% in a typical mash is sucrose. That's also a very simple sugar, very easy for the yeast to attack. Then the big one is maltose. Maltose is two of those six carbon rings that are bonded together. It's called the one four bond. And that's around two thirds of most beer wort is maltose. And maltose is also fermentable. It's not as easily fermentable as glucose, fructose and sucrose, but the yeast can handle it. Essentially every strain of brewing yeast can handle maltose. Then we got maltotriose, which is three. You see the tri in the middle of the Greek for three. Maltotriose is three of those six carbon rings or three glucose molecules that are bonded together. And that's typically around 17 and a half percent or so. And that one is not necessarily all gonna ferment, although some strains handle it well. Some yeast strains and others handle it a little less well. And finally, not part of the, if you add all those up, it adds up to 100. Not part of that 100% is dextrins. The dextrins are not fermentable. These are more complex, I think polysaccharide or something is the word. And your yeast is not going to ferment dextrins. They will contribute body and they'll also help you with head on your beer. They'll get, uh, help make a more stable foam, but they're not going to be fermentable. Dextrins can be byproduct of the mashing process, just like all these other sugars can, however. So. The important thing to remember from this, this is gonna be the last time I mention any of these by name, but the important thing to remember is that not all of these sugars are created equally. So even if you're converting all your starch into sugar, not all of that sugar is necessarily gonna be fermentable. Composition varies and it's going to affect your beer. If you have more fermentable sugar, you'll get a drier beer, probably a little less body. If you have more unfermentable sugar, you're gonna have a sweeter finishing beer and more body, also probably greater foam scale. All right, so mashing enzymes. When we mash, what we're doing, we're adding hot water to grain, to milled grain. And if you want to take the sort of relax, don't worry, have a homebrew method. You throw it in, as long as that water's kind of in the ballpark between 140 Fahrenheit and 160 Fahrenheit, and you let it sit for somewhere between 30 minutes and two or more hours, it's going to make beer. It's going to mash, right? You're going to have some conversion of starch into sugar, that's all you need to make beer. That's your relax, don't worry, have a homebrew method. We want to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty when we're practicing or trying to master the mash um, and think about the specific enzymes and target the specific enzymes that we want to create the work that we want. So understand that the enzymes that are doing the mashing, they come from the grain. You can think of the grain in very simple terms as being like, a starchy endosperm, which is kind of the inner part of the grain kernel, and that's the bulk of it. It's the white, 
uh, very white, almost powdery when you break into it part. And surrounded by that is what's called an alurone layer. That alurone layer contains enzymes. And then around that is a husk. That alurone layer and those husks are both pretty thin. The bulk of the kernel is the starchy endosperm. These grains, one day they aspired to grow into plants, right? They're seeds. And the way that works in nature for the plant is you wet the seed and that triggers a reaction in the seed to start essentially liberating the enzymes from the alurone layer. And those enzymes start to break down the starch that's in the starchy endosperm to create sugar. And that sugar is what the plant uses to grow. Humans figured out probably millennia ago, probably back in the Sumerian days, that we could sort of hack this process. We could wet the grain, we could liberate the enzymes, and then we could heat it and stop it. And what that does is it now has, it's called malting. And the significance of that is that you still have the starchy endosperm, but the alurone layer has now been liberated into these enzymes, which for us as brewers, we're gonna use in the mashing process. And there's really, I listed here three, but there's really two enzymes, diastatic enzymes that we're primarily concerned with. And the diastatic enzymes are the ones that convert starch into sugar which is what we're doing when we're mashing. So beta amylase, alpha amylase, and then the third one is limit dextrinase. I put an asterisk by limit dextrinase because for most of us, unless we're mashing at very cool temperatures, it's not gonna be a primary player. But for completeness sake, you should understand it's present and it's a diastatic enzyme. So the takeaway from this is teamwork makes the dream work. These enzymes can work together. They work by different mechanisms. Um, but they can work uh, in conjunction with one another in producing uh, the mash. That makes the process a little bit more complex, but as brewers, it also gives us a little bit more flexibility. So here's a little bit more detail. This is where I'm gonna use the laser pointer. This, uh, each one of the, on this graph, what you're looking at here is a, is a starch molecule. This whole thing, this weird, I don't know how you describe that, but this, this, I don't know, sideways, L or something, um, whatever this shape you want to call it, each one of these hexagons is a glucose molecule. And these glucose molecules are, are bound together here. This is that 1,4 bond that I was talking about. On this graphic, the blue arrow represents beta amylase. And beta amylase has the ability to attack, for lack of a better word, this starch molecule in very specific places. Specifically, it can attack it two glucose molecules in from the non-reducing end. So this is a non-reducing end, this is a non-reducing end. The beta amylase is able to come along here and attack right at this bond, and it can break this piece off, and when it does, that two glucose piece, remember that's maltose. I said before, maltose is two glucose molecules joined together. So when the beta amylase cleaves this off, now you got a maltose and then you got the rest of this. And then it can come and it can cleave it right here and make another maltose. But it has to work sequentially on that non-reducing end and it can only cleave off maltose, two glucose molecules at a time. Alpha amylase, which is the red arrows, they can cleave kind of at random, mostly wherever they want. They can't get too close to this bond here, which is like a different, a different kind of bond. It's not the one four and it can't get too close to it, but as long as it's at one of the ends, the reducing or the non-reducing, it can come and just kind of attack wherever it wants. And if it attacks here, or it attacks here, or if it attacks here, it's gonna cleave off one glucose molecule. If it attacks here, it's gonna cleave off a maltotriose molecule. If it attacks here, it's gonna cleave off a maltose molecule. So you get more diversity of sugars that are cleaved off by your alpha amylase. And just generally speaking, the alpha amylase works more quickly than the beta amylase works. So you don't really need to know all the details of the reducing end, the non-reducing end, et cetera. But what's important to take away from this is the different kind of sugars that beta amylase produces, which is essentially only maltose, and the sugars that alpha amylase produces, which can be glucose, it can be maltose, it can be maltotriose, but it can also be dextrins, right? If the, if the alpha amylase attacks right here, now you just made a four glucose molecule that's a dextrin, and that's gonna be an unfermentable sugar. All right, that's all the science. Now we're gonna to get to the more fun stuff, the experimental framework.
So I set about to design an experiment that would hopefully model common all grain homebrew setup. I mean, I was it's kind of being selfish with this. I wanted something that was going to provide me with information about how my mash was likely to perform. And so the setup that I have at home, I have a single infusion. Well, I have a, a separate mash ton, and I use what's called a Herm system, which is a way of indirectly heating the wort in order to maintain steady temperature. Um, a rim setup will accomplish the same thing, but it's a more direct heat application. But the idea was that I wanted to have something where it was a self-contained mash vessel with a steady temperature. So throughout the duration of the mash, the temperature is going to be held constant. And I wanted to do an experiment that used common homebrew ingredients. Um, there are other people who have done similar setups to this. If you're familiar with uh, Kai Troster and the Brow Kaiser website, it's kind of a really amazing resource. It looked like kind of before my time when I really got into homebrewing. But he set up this blog and has all kinds of experiments that he did back in the around 2010, 2011. And he did similar experiments, but using uh, Bohemian Pilsner Mall, using bread yeast. I wanted to use the kind of ingredients that a lot of us use when we're making American ales at home. So I used uh, two-row malt, and then White Labs generously donated some WLP-001 dry yeast for me to use in the experiment. Another important thing in the experimental design was trying to come up with a design where I could really lock down the control variables. I showed you all the process control points before. There's a lot of things, a lot of things to lock down and control if you want to just pick one experimental variable that you're manipulating. So to make sure that everything else, to eliminate the chances of something else impacting the results, I use RO water, which happens to also be what I usually start with when I'm brewing. I use the same water chemistry on all these mashes. I just came up with this because, again, it's similar ratios to what I use when I homebrew. That works out to around 80 or so ppm of chloride and 90 ppm of sulfate and 100 and some odd ppm of calcium in that ballpark. Um, not a fancy, a fairly soft water profile, but just something that was very uh, simple to use. And 1.2 was a good number because it's divisible by two, three, four, and six. So if I had to add three quarts, then I could add 0.4 grams, et cetera. Just very uh, selfish decision to use those numbers. I wanted to use the same ingredients for every mash. So I chose Great Western Two Row Malt as my sort of base malt that I use for just about everything, WLP-001 as my yeast. Same weights and volumes where possible. So for almost all of these trials, I did 64 grams of, of grain and 200 milliliters of liquor or water. And I chose those numbers because if you do all the unit conversions, 64 grams, to 200 milliliters works out to almost exactly 1.5 quarts per pound. And most of us, when we think about mash thickness, we think about quarts per pound. 1.5 is a fairly common ratio a lot of us use. So 64 grams to 200 milliliters worked out to 1.5. They were also numbers that, again, were sort of easy for me to remember. 200 milliliters was filling up my graduated cylinder two times because it's a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. So convenient numbers. I think that's an important part of the design because First of all, you're more likely to remember, less likely to screw up. Um, same weights and volumes for each of these trials. I just talked about that. And then finally, an easily rep replicable and monitorable process. You don't want to do something that requires a lot of dexterity when you're transferring this to that or a lot of very careful timing because that's just an opportunity where you can screw up, an opportunity where you can introduce human error that's going to interfere with the precision and accuracy of your results. And then in order to maximize that precision, pick your measuring instruments. For me, I used, I have one of those Anton Parr desktop uh, gravity readers, uh, Easy Dens. I love it, uh, but I was able to get the Easy Dens. I've been using it in brewing for years and calibrate that thing to make sure that with RO water, it's reading 1.000. And then essentially you can trust it as long as you're reading at a consistent temperature which I was. Same thing with the pH meter. Uh, I was using the Pocket Pro Plus from Hoth. Just make sure every time you use it that you calibrate it with the calibration solutions because otherwise your numbers will be off. And finally, set up your process so that you're carefully tracking measurements at multiple and consistent points. So pick certain points where you're gonna measure the weight um, and you'll see in the process when you go through uh, and make sure that you're measuring at the same time every single time 
and you're very religious about that and that you're as careful as you can be, don't take shortcuts because then if you get goofy data, you'll start doubting yourself and say, well, is it because I took shortcuts when I was recording my data? All right, so here was my initial plan. Initially, I was like, I got all these vacuum insulated thermoses. These things are so great at like holding temperature. That's what they're designed for. It's kind of a marvel of physics. And I use my Starbucks stars. If you get like 400 stars, you can get one of these things for free. So I save up a bunch of Starbucks stars and got all these thermoses. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to have all these little mash tons. I'm just going to dough in. It's going to be at the temperature and it's going to sit there for 60 minutes. Separate mash vessels, which is perfect. Independent temperature. So I could do one at 143 and one at 146 and one at 149. And it's going to be awesome. And then I realized it doesn't really hold the mash temperature that steady. Over the course of an hour, I was getting like a six degree drop Fahrenheit, which isn't the end of the world, but it wasn't what I wanted. And I tried throwing them in the sous vide to say, oh, well, maybe if I surround it by warm water, I'll have less temperature drop. And it was still like a five degree temperature drop. I think maybe the vacuum insulation was making it so the sous vide wasn't really doing much. Uh, either way, it was more of a temperature drop than I was willing to handle. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and I came up with a new idea, which was breast milk storage bags. And these are amazing. Uh, it helps if you have a one-year-old, as like we do, because you have a bunch of breast milk storage bags sitting around. But really, I mean, look at this thing in the picture. Like, it stands up on its own. So you can pour liquid into it. You can pour grain into it. The bag is, like, thin enough that the heat transfers very easily in the sous vide, but it's thick enough that it holds together. And because breast milk is, like, more precious than gold, the seal on the top of these things is amazing. I have not had a single one in 78 mashes, knock on wood. I have not had a single one leak on me. So again, we got separate mash vessels, common temperature, because you throw all these in the sous vide and that sous vide liquid, the water is all the same. So now all of a sudden you don't have to worry about, you know, are you two degrees off on this thermos and versus that thermos? Like they're all exactly the same. Um, and you get a steady mash temperature throughout the duration of your mash. So this was the way to go. Oh, and a bonus is that they're clear, so you can see kind of what's going on. If you see a clump or you see something's not mixed well, or you can start to see when the mash goes from being starchy and cloudy to being glassy and clear, and you know the conversions happen. So big proponent of these Medela. I did try a couple other brands. The Medela worked the best, but other brands are fine. Breast milk bags. All right, so here's what we do. First of all, to prepare the grain, we weigh it. See right there, I got 64.0 grams. I use my little gram, little drug dealer scale. Gets down to a tenth of a gram, which like a tenth of a gram is one kernel. Like that's how I, at the end I'm sitting there moving one kernel of grain. Next, we're going to set the gap on the mill. There's, you know, me with the feeler gauge. That one's 0.025 inches, but set the gap. If you have a mill, that's a malt monster three. It's a three roller mill. Um, if you have a mill, you set the gap. If you don't, you just trust the store that they hopefully set the gap in a consistent way. Third, you mill it. And fourth, you bag it. And that picture is, you know, that's like, I don't know, three times seven. That's 21 different little baggies. But why, Doug, did you separately weigh out 64 grams, mill it, and then bag it? Well, the reason is if I just did like 500 grams and milled it and then tried to scoop up 64 grams at a time, it wasn't necessarily going to be consistent because some of the husky, like thicker material will be at the top and then the powder would be at the bottom and each bag wouldn't necessarily have the same, the same amount of starch, the same amount of husk. So I wanted to really make sure that each bag was like the, the exact same. So it takes a lot more time, but you get a little more precision. Next, executing the mash. You start by weighing the baggie. That one came out to 66.6. .6. Those bags are 2.5 grams. So that means there's like an extra 0.1 grams of probably like leftover dust or something or just maybe a little bit of air. And 0.1 grams is like nothing. So you, you do that to verify that all your grain got in the bag. Then you weigh your liquor. Uh, those breast milk bags are about 5 grams. So this one came out to 204.5. And the one cool thing about the metric system is that one milliliter of water is equal to one gram. So that means I had 199.5 milliliters of water. My graduated cylinder was really close. I like spilled a couple drops. And then you mix and mash. And this one's got a video. It's not really a very exciting video, but if you click on that picture, you see 
just in the middle of it. You don't have to click the, the play button, just in the middle of it, I think. Anyway, you'll see the sous vide is on and the water, you can kind of see little ripples on the water and it's circulating. And I usually, for most of these, there you go, put eight of these baggies in there. There's one other step that I'll add before HomebrewCon. After I mix the grain in the bag, I weigh it again. And the reason I weigh it again is just basically as a check to make sure that no grain spilled or no water spilled to make sure that it, it basically is the grain weight plus the liquor weight is what made it into the bag. So I mean, really anal, but the reason I'm being really anal with this, you know, one of the things I wanna measure is efficiency. And if you think about it, like 64 grams of grain, if you lose one gram, you've just lost like one and a half percent efficiency right off the top. So like with the law of small numbers, trying to get as precise as possible with this and make sure you don't lose a gram when you're transferring is important. And, and thankfully, there's enough slack at the top of these bags that I was able to pour without losing. All right, after the mash, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, however long it was, this is my louder. I just take a, I think that's like a oil change funnel and then a little like kitchen sieve that's fine enough that, you know, some of the powder makes it through, but none of the uh, husky stuff makes it through. And I just dump the bag on top. I made, this is another one that's a video if you click on this one. I made kind of the executive decision at the start of this that I didn't want to do a sparge. And the reason I didn't want to do a sparge is because I felt like the sparge was going to introduce another set of moving parts where if the sparge water didn't evenly go over the grain, you know, if it only went over the middle or the sides, it wouldn't extract the sugars the same way. And so just by doing a no sparge dump, I thought I'd get better consistency. And we'll talk about that at the end. Now pitch, this is the last video. Um, after you kind of run it in there, oh, I didn't say it on here, but I cool it first. I cool it to room temperature, and then I pitch. Uh, what I did for pitch is I used dry yeast, because if I tried to use liquid yeast, that's gonna screw up the gravity on a scale this small. You know, a five gallon batch, who cares? But if you're doing, you know, it's 140 milliliters that makes it into this flask, the liquid from a liquid yeast is gonna distort your numbers. So I used dry yeast, White Labs, WLP001. I did five of those little scoops. The important thing is that you over pitch. You wanna just make sure you get way more yeast than it needs. It's like a forced fermentation test because all we're trying to do is measure attenuability. So you spoon in five little spoons like that of yeast, and then behold, that picture is taken like a day later. See the yeast is taken off like gangbusters. That that dry uh, 001 yeast, I've been really happy with it. And you give it two or three days, and two or three days because of that high pitch rate, the fermentation is done, and you're ready to do your measurement. And then output. So this is kind of what we're trying, there's two numbers really that we're focused on trying to get. One is extract efficiency. And efficiency is a measure, it's a ratio of your uh, percentage of the potential sugar extraction that you actually realized. So it's the quotient, it's the actual gravity that you achieved divided by the potential gravity that you could have achieved. And in that formula, gravity is based on extract FG of the malt that you used. Extract FG stands for extract fine grain. That's a, any malt spec sheet or maltster when you buy their, their, their grain will tell you what the extract FG is. And that's done in a laboratory using a Congress mask so that they have a standardized method of telling you how much sugar could you possibly get out of this if you got every last bit. And then the other number, from my perspective for this presentation, really the more important number is the apparent attenuation. And this is gonna give you a measure of the fermentability of the wort. So if you remember, different sugar composition worts are gonna have different fermentability because they may have some dextrins or maltotriose that are not fermentable in a higher or lower ratio. So the apparent attenuation looks at your original gravity minus your final gravity divided by your original gravity minus one. And I gave you an example. If you had a 1050 OG beer and it finished at 1010, so maybe this is like an American Blonde Ale. What's the apparent attenuation? You take 1050 minus 1010, divide it by 1050 minus one, and you get basically 40 divided by 50 or 80%. So the higher that number, the higher your apparent attenuation, the more fermentable your work was. Crush, all right, now we're looking at our process control points. I call crush the control point we can't always control because unless you have your own mill, you're not, not gonna be able to control it. You're just gonna take whatever crush they give you, which is okay. It turns out um, crush matters for some and doesn't matter for other things that much. 
Fundamentals of the crush, we talked about this a little bit already. When you roll the grain kernel through the mill, it's gonna expose the starchy endosperm, which is that white middle part that has all the starch, that powdery part that breaks open. And the tighter you make your mill gap, the, the tighter your mill is set, it's gonna create more finer particles. And those fine particles are more accessible by the enzymes in the mash, so you make it more readily converted, more readily converted. The flip side is the coarser particles, the bigger particles, are gonna help give you a more solid grain bed for loudering. So when you're loudering from your mash tun into your boil kettle, if you have too fine of a mash, you can end up with a dreaded stuck sparge. And the liquid isn't gonna flow because all that fine powder just sort of cakes up and becomes like a glue. So having some of those thicker husky parts helps to create a, a filter bed that enables the work to run through. So a good milling process produces a range of particle sizes. And there's a whole nother talk and you can get into a two roller mill versus a three roller mill and how to set the mill to maximize your loudering. But for our purposes, the objective is to crush the starchy endosperm really as finely as possible while still leaving the husk as intact as necessary to get a good loudering. And that's gonna depend from mill to mill, and it's gonna depend from mash ton to mash ton. So I can't even tell you what the right number is. It's gonna depend on your circumstances. Most, uh, you know, John Palmer recommends for home brewers, usually on most mills, if you crush between 35 thousandths of an inch and 42 thousandths of an inch, you'll be fine. Uh, personally, I crush at 32 thousandths of an inch, a little bit below that, I've never had a stuck sponge. Take that for what it's worth. Here's the data. Well, let's go back just a quick second. If we talk about our hypotheses, what do we expect from crush? The literature, the science tells us that crush shouldn't really have much impact on the apparent attenuation because the apparent attenuation is based on the enzymatic processes and your crush isn't gonna have any impact on the enzymatic processes, but it is gonna have an impact on how much starch is accessible to the enzymes. So we would expect that as we have a finer crush, we'll have a greater extraction. And sure enough, I've run two trials on this so far, and these were some of the earlier trials that I ran. Hopefully by HomebrewCon, I'll rerun these trials because the data is a little bit noisy. But I ran them at 146 Fahrenheit and 155 Fahrenheit. You see the yellow line is 146, the orange is 155. And in both cases, as the mill gap got bigger, so in other words, as the crush got more coarse, running from left to right, you got a lower efficiency with the best fit line. So sure enough, it does check out not a huge difference between the 146 and the 155. I was interested in whether maybe alpha versus beta amylase showed a different sort of efficiency gain. And the data is noisy enough that I wouldn't draw any conclusion in that regard. But there is a general pattern and fairly significant, right? We're going from 75% down to 60. That's a pretty big difference in efficiency. Time and temperature. These are the two primary ones. This is the foundation of any mash is gonna be your time and temperature. It's also the one that most people, when they first start doing all grain, it's really all they're focused on is time and temperature, which is okay. It gets you most of the way there. But what the science tells us about temperature is that temperature should have the greatest control on enzymatic action. Enzymatic activity generally increases with temperature. So for any given enzyme, the warmer it is, the faster that enzyme is gonna work until it doesn't. And you're gonna reach for every enzyme, there's a point where the enzyme just can't take it anymore. It starts going faster and faster and faster, and then it just starts denaturing. It reaches that point where it's just too hot and it, it craps out. And so you see on the graph here, you know, it kind of slowly ramps up and then it hits that point where it starts denaturing and it kind of falls off a cliff. So it's kind of this, this game as a brewer, if you're trying to maximize the enzymatic activity using temperature of pushing up as close as possible to that denaturing point without going over it. Because when you go over it, it falls off. Here's the guidelines for the three enzymes that we talked about. As I mentioned before, limit dextrinase, the active range is in the cooler, you know, 113 to 131. So we're not, most of the time, certainly not on a single infusion mash, we're not ever really targeting limit dextrinase. And it starts denaturing rapidly at 149 Fahrenheit. So a lot of our mashes are starting above that. But the beta amylase and the alpha amylase, just think of beta amylase as really in that 140 to 150 range. And then alpha, the happiest place for alpha is kind of in the 150 to 160 and preferably on the higher end of that range. 
and it rapidly denatures at 176, but it really, it starts denaturing at 168. 10 minutes at 168 will denature both your alpha and your beta amylase, which is why most of the literature recommends doing a mash out at 168 for 10 minutes. Time, the important thing to know about time is that enzymatic activity is not constant, even at a certain temperature. So you set your mash at a certain temperature, the activity of those enzymes is still gonna vary as a function of time, even if you hold the temperature the same. Um, according to Wolfgang Kunz, who's sort of one of the grandfathers of science of brewing, enzymatic activity starts slowly. In those first 10 or 15 minutes, the gelatinization is occurring. You're not getting very much diastatic enzyme activity. Neither your alpha or your beta is doing very much. But after those first 10 minutes is your peak activity. And between minute 10 and minute 20 is the fastest enzymatic activity that you're gonna have. And then after about 40 to 60 minutes, so about 45 minutes to an hour into your mash, the activity is gonna start falling off. And the higher your temperature is, the more it's gonna fall off. If you're at cooler temperatures, it'll say it's somewhat more constant, but it's still gonna decrease. Palmer's suggestions in his book, How to Brew, are similar. He says, you know, for a full conversion, it varies from between less than 30 minutes and 60 minutes. Uh, Any general recommendation for homebrewers is an hour. So this, this data, this scientific data, is why most people recommend for homebrewers that you mash for about an hour, because that's generally enough. You're gonna get full conversion at an hour, and you generally start getting diminishing returns after an hour. But sometimes as little as 30 minutes or less will get you almost all the way there. And depending on what your schedule is, how pressed for time you are, or maybe you want something that's less fermentable, you may elect to deliberately go with a shorter mash. So here's the data. Um, this is another area where there's a little bit of work to be done. This is based on three trials, one at 143, which was aimed at targeting beta amylase, one at 158, which was aimed at targeting alpha amylase, and then one at 149, which is aimed at targeting both. 149 is kind of that sweet spot where you're getting sort of maximum beta activity, but you're also getting as much alpha as you can. Efficiency-wise, those lines are pretty flat. And there's also quite a bit of noise in that data. You see the yellow dots in particular are strained from that line quite a bit. So, it, you know, the orange line, it looks like you're starting to get a little bit of increased efficiency with more time, but it's, there's so much noise that I wouldn't draw any conclusions from this. Apparent attenuation, however, the orange and yellow tell a very clear story, which is as we go left to right with a longer mash, and I did eight of these, you can see at the bottom the control data that I used to keep all the other variables the same. You see a very clear increase for the first approximately 60 minutes, and then it starts to, it's, continues to increase, but it flattens out. So this is exactly the kind of curve that we would expect uh, based on the science. You're shaking your head about that 158 line, and why does it seem like the attenuation went down as the mash got longer? I don't know. And I will say this is the first of these trials that I ran. I've run 10 of these trials so far and that 158 was the first. I've made improvements to the trials as I've learned things as I've gone. So I'm gonna repeat that 158 before HomebrewCon. I, that very well may be my error or it may be a curious result, I don't know. But I, for now I wouldn't draw any conclusions from that, that gray line. But the orange and the yellow, that was like the fourth and fifth trial I ran. So those were, my process was locked in by the fourth and fifth trial. All right, let's look next at pH. And I wrote on here, relax, don't worry, because pH is a rabbit hole. pH is a whole nother, pH is like a three hour talk to really properly cover pH. And it, it's well beyond the scope of what we have time for today for me to sort of explain to you the science behind pH, for me to explain to you how to control pH, but I'll tell you this, pH has a lot of different impacts in the brewing process. pH affects your beer color, it affects your foam, it affects your mash, as we're about to find out, it affects your flavor, uh, pH affects your flavor stability, it affects your microbial stability, pH has a lot of effects, a lot of impact on your final beer. And so, don't, when you're thinking about pH, you gotta think holistically. You may come up with a pH that maximizes your attenuation or maximizes your efficiency, but it may have other downstream effects that may make the beer not taste the way you want it to taste. So just keep all that in mind when we're talking about pH. pH is one knob you can turn, but it isn't necessarily the knob that you want to turn if it has other impacts on your beer that are unfavorable. And that, that's all, I'll do another talk in years about that. 
So here's the science about pH. And for pH, it impacts activity, the enzymatic activity, but usually less than temperature does. And the important thing to understand about pH here is that each enzyme, and it's unique for each enzyme, has its own optimum pH. And so on this graph here, we got the pH is the x-axis and the enzymatic activity is the y-axis. And this is a graph I pulled from Kunz and it's not empirical data. This is just to give you sort of an intuitive sense of how it functions. But when you're in this middle, in this sort of happy range, whatever this range of pH is kind of right down here, your enzymatic activity is pretty good. But if you go too low or if you go too high, it starts to fall off a cliff. So that's what I want you to understand about pH is that each of these enzymes has a sweet spot. And it's a sweet spot that's multiple tenths of a point of pH. And as long as you're within that range, you're going to get mostly the same activity. But if you fall outside of that range, you're going to fall off. So this graph, let's just skip it. Um, it's not a good use of our time. pH guidelines. It, it, depending on what book you look at, it's going to give you different numbers. According to Kuhn's beta amylase prefers between 5.4 and 5.5, and alpha prefers 5.6 to 5.8. And then I got here four different books, recommended mashing ranges. Banforth says 5.3 to 5.8 at mash temp. Briggs says 5.1 to 5.3 mash temp, but 5.4 to 5.7 at 77, which is kind of weird. Kuhn says 5.5 to 5.6, and he doesn't say if it's mash temp or not. And Palmer says 5.4 to 5.8 at 77. And what does all this talk about mash temp? Well, pH changes as temperature changes. So as temperature increases, pH tends to be lower. So the same solution may have a pH of 5.1 at mashing temperature, and then when you take it to room temp, it's 5.4, just because the chemical reactions that are happening are different at different temperatures. So it's a, whole, it's a really crazy topic. Ashton Lewis from BYO has a really good article about it that's linked in this slide. Um, also, when I mentioned that to you about temperature, the takeaway for that is make sure that you're measuring your temperature at a consistent point. For me, I always measure it at room temperature. So that's the higher of the numbers. Usually it's about a 0.25 to 0.3 difference between mash temp, which is lower, and room temp, which is higher. But if you have a pH meter that has ATC, or automatic temperature compensation, do not think that that is correcting your mash temperature for the room temperature versus mash temp. ATC is doing something very different. So you still need to measure at a consistent temperature. I recommend room temperature to preserve your pH probe. All right, so here's the data on extract efficiency. Again, we got three mashes, one targeting beta, one targeting alpha, one tar targeting both. You know, it kind of looks efficiency-wise, you see a lot of noise, first of all. You see those dots are straying pretty far from the line. A lot of noise. I wouldn't draw any firm conclusions from this, but we do see our 155, which is our alpha, seems to be peak efficiency right here around 5.45, which jives with, I think, what was on the previous slide. Yep, alpha likes the higher, beta likes the lower. And it does look like, you know, our 143, that's peaking kind of over here. So about two or three tenths lower. But again, a lot of noise. Don't draw the firm from that. Apparent attenuation, however, we got much tighter, much tighter data. Uh, and here, all three of these mashes seem to be doing really pretty well from an attenuation perspective, anywhere between about 5.3 and 5.65. 5.35, 5 5.65, we're getting very similar numbers. But when we start getting down here below 5.2, the apparent attenuation falls off a cliff. So if you have a beer, particularly if you're an RO brewer like I am, for us RO brewers, it's hard to get very much alkalinity in our water. We oftentimes end up with very low mash pHs. And if you have a beer that didn't attenuate well, I have a beer to guard that I just did that had this problem. And I look back and it turns out, yeah, my mash pH was like 5.15. And that's why the beer didn't attenuate very well for me probably because my mash pH was too low. All right, thickness. This is our water to grist ratio. The literature says that thinner mashes, so over like two quarts per pound, which is quite thin by homebrew standards, are usually gonna have slower conversion, quicker denaturing, but they might be more fermentable. There's some conflicts in the literature about that. Thicker mashes, and that's listed as below 1.25 quarts per pound, which is very thick, uh, should have faster conversion. I think the idea is that the enzymes are just closer to the starch, there's less sort of water for them to swim around in. Uh, longer lasting activity, I think, again, the idea is that there's, they're more buffered, uh, but maybe less fermentable. 
Again, question mark. No data on this because I haven't run this trial yet. So if you want to see the thickness data, you got to come to HomebrewCon. But here's the guidelines. Um, Briggs says thinner mashes convert more starch. Thicker mashes produce more fermentable sugars, according to Coons. But then, you know, it says the best is achieved by 1.2 quarts per pound, which is already quite thick, or quite, yeah, quite thick. Um, and then attenuability, both Nargis and Briggs say it doesn't matter very much. We'll see if my data confirms that or not. Palmer recommends between 1.5 and 2 quarts. Again, we'll see if the data confirms that. Lastly, but not leastly, grist composition. This was probably my favorite trial. I was really looking forward to doing this one, and it's the most recent one that I've done. The important thing about grist composition is it essentially determines how much enzyme is in your mash. Because it turns out the amount of enzymes that's in various kinds of malt is not the same. And you can think of um, the amount of enzyme that's in the malt as being called enzymatic power. So a, a malt that has a lot of enzyme in it, like a base two row, American two row, it's one of the highest, that has high enzymatic power. Uh, six row is even higher enzymatic power. But then the, usually, roughly speaking, the darker the malt is, the more it's been kilned, the less enzymatic power it has. Which sort of makes sense, because in the mashing process, that heat is denaturing some of those enzymes and causing it to lose diastatic power. So highly kilned base malts, like Munich, particularly dark Munich, have significantly less enzymatic power than lighter kiln base malts, like Two Row or Pilsner. Caramel and roasted malts basically have no enzymatic power. They've been heated so much that the enzymatic power is all gone. And then most adjuncts, you know, corn, rice, wheat, they tend to have less enzymatic power as well. So some strategies for maybe how to counteract a grist that has low diastatic power. Say you want to make a Doppelbach that's going to have a lot of Munich malt, and you know Munich malt has less diastatic power than your Pilsner or your Two-Row. One strategy, and this is probably the preferred strategy, is to do a longer mash time. So just think about there's less enzymes in your mash when you start out. So to compensate for that, you need to give those fewer enzymes more time to do the same amount of work as they would be able to do at a, at a higher diastatic power. And another way to possibly counteract it would be with lower mash temperatures. Maybe lower mash temperatures enable you to get more attenuability because you're favoring beta amylase. You may get less efficiency, you may get less sugar out of the mash, but what you get may be more fermentable if that's what you're going for. So let's get into the data. First of all, here's the trial I did. I did eight bags, eight mashes per trial. I did two trials, each with eight. And I used varying blends of Great Western Two Row, and I used Breeze Crystal 40 as my sort of adjunct or my secondary malt. So this first bag over here is just 64-0. That's pure Two Row. And then this one here, in increments of four grams, it's 60 grams of Two Row and four grams of Crystal, all the way up to 36 grams of Two Row and 28 grams of Crystal. And you can see the color gets progressively darker as you go left to right. And same thing, this is right before I pitch the yeast. You can see it gets kind of like a real rainbow if it was like a malt rainbow. It's like a pride week, pride month mass trial. So here's our data. I did a 60 minute and I did a 150 minute and I'll tell you in a minute why I did those. But you do see that pretty clearly as the percentage of crystal malt increases from zero to up to 42% was like the, the max, our efficiency goes down. And that was the case both in the 60 minute mash and at the 150 minute mash. And you may notice something a little bit curious about this graph. I know I'm running through this fast. So I'll give you a hint. I'll just tell you actually what it is. What's weird to me about this graph is that the 60 minute mash had better extraction efficiency than the 150 minute mash, which is really the opposite of what I would have expected. And I think the reason for this is because in that 150 minute mash, I let those bags cool to room temperature before I dumped them and did my kind of louder. And in the 60 minute mash, I did them while they were still hot. And I think that more of the sugars got left behind on the grains in the bag that had cooled. More of those sugars had kind of coalesced and stuck on the grain. And because I was doing no sparge, there wasn't any way to pick it up. So these are the two most recent trials that I did. And they were kind of a learning point for me that actually I need to be even more careful with my process and make sure that I dump the bags at the consistent temperature. Because I, for any given trial, I'm dumping all eight of them at the same time. But between trials, I sometimes, depending on if I was watching a kid or watching TV or doing something else, might have let those bags sit for a while. And I think that had an impact here. 
apparent attenuation. Now, this is my favorite graph of the whole thing because the reason I wanted to see between, oh, that that's labeled incorrectly. Where it says 149, that should say 60 minutes. Um, and the, the orange line is 150 minutes. I have always heard this maxim that crystal malts contain, you know, a lot of unfermentable sugar, right? We've all, most of us, I think, if you're homebrew, you've heard that, right? If you use too much crystal malt, you're not going to get good attenuation because crystal malts are unfermentable sugar. And I was always wondering, I was like, what does that even mean? Because all this stuff gets mashed. And I don't think, like, the alpha amylase or beta amylase enzyme is going to care whether a sugar came from a two-row starch molecule or whether the sugar came from a C crystal 40 molecule. Like, what does the enzyme care? What Does that mean that the, the sugars that are in the crystal, the enzymes can't break them down? Or does it just mean that as it is, they're unfermentable? So I said, well, what if I, like, stretch out the mash and do it longer? Because I know the diastatic power is less when we have a lot of crystal. But maybe if I just give it more time, those quote unquote unfermentable sugars are actually fermentable. And I think this graph bears that out. You see a parent attenuation as the crystal malt percentage increases, particularly in the yellow line, which is the 60 minute trial, you know, it, it, it degrades significantly. As we get up here to 42% crystal, uh, you know, this one finished, I want to say at like 1.012 or something. No, 1.008. And this finished at like 1.016. So quite a big difference. Twice as much unfermentable sugar left in the end. But when I stretch that mash out to two and a half hours instead of one hour, that line, yeah, it still goes down, but it flattens out significantly, right? The difference between the attenuation with the 0% crystal malt was fairly minor. You go from like, you know, 82 to 85. But when you get down here, all of a sudden, what used to be only 66% is now like 75%. So a lot of those sugars that might have appeared to have been unfermentable, turns out are fermentable. So I think the takeaway from this is let's stop. I gotta do one more trial. I wanna do one where I go like overnight, where it's like eight or 10 hours and see if I can get that line like almost flat. But I'm gonna do one more trial like this and see if I can get a really nice flat line. And I know the enzymatic activity slows down over time, but I think if I do it long enough, 10 or 12 hours, I think we'll be able to prove that those unfermentable sugars are actually fermentable. You just gotta mash them long enough or add a bunch of six row, which has more enzymes, or you know, obviously you know, use less. If you're, if you're here at like 10% crystal, which is kind of a good number, it's not that big of a difference, especially if you do a two and a half hour mash. So if you wanna make like a really dry crystal malt beer, I think you can, you just have to be patient. All right, so wrap up, 51 minutes. Some specific lessons learned. Experimental design, breast milk storage bags work very well to simulate RIMS and HERMS mashing. I could not have been happier with that discovery because they're not that expensive. They're really easy to use. But for those of you who mash in like an igloo cooler or mash in a system that doesn't use RIMS or HERMS, get yourself some of those vacuum insulated thermoses because actually those may be a better simulation for you because that five degree Fahrenheit drop over 60 minutes might be what you kind of have in your mash ton. So you'll end up getting data that's more relevant to you. Um, so, so do that. Um, some lessons about extract efficiency. Crush matter is a pretty big bit. Remember we saw going from 25 thousandths to 50 thousandths, there was a pretty big difference in the efficiency. But for all the other trials, the extract efficiency data was really pretty noisy. And it doesn't look like, if anything, it was a very secondary effect when you did with a different temperature or a different time or a different pH on your extract efficiency. My hypothesis here is that Extract efficiency is largely determined by physical factors. So essentially, you know, with the crush, it's how much of that starch is getting exposed, but then it may be sort of how wide your mash ton is, how much, when you louder, if you're sparging, how much sparge water you use to rinse those sugars. I think it has less to do with enzymes. I think it has more to do with physics. But attenuability, on the other hand, has a lot to do with enzymes. And we saw some pretty dramatic effects with time, temperature, pH, and even brisk composition. Time and temperature had the most significant effects at least as long as you're staying within the pH sort of happy range. But pH can also significantly impair attenuability if you fall outside of that range. So this is kind of a troubleshooting thing. You got, as a brewer, you have a lot of slack. And if you're not really paying much attention to your pH, if you're just using tap water and you dough in, you're, pretty much, you're usually going to land in that optimal range. But if you're using a lot of dark malts, it's going to become more acidic. Or if you're using RO water, it's going to be more acidic. Or if you're adding a lot of salts to your water, it's going to be more acidic. 
you could fall out of that range, and that may explain why your attenuation was less than you might have expected. And then diastatic power. Don't overlook the importance of diastatic power in your grist. You know, you're trying to make a double bock, you're trying to make it really dry. Temperature matters, but time may matter more. That may be the beer where it's worth setting aside an extra 60 or 90 minutes to let that amylase rest sit. Because remember that Munich malt has less diastatic power and let the enzymes that are there have more time to do the job. And then crystal malt, is the sugar really unfermentable? I'm gonna stop saying that. Uh, you can decide for yourself if you wanna keep saying that. But I'm gonna say crystal malt has no diastatic power. And so if you're using a lot of crystal malt, you can do the same thing as if you're using a lot of roasted malt or kilned malt or any malt with low diastatic power. You need to do more time or a different temperature to compensate for that. So areas for future exploration. Um, experimental design, I want to try to figure out a way to do this with sparging because I would like to get some efficiency data that's more meaningful. And I do think that there probably is a difference between how much sugar is getting left behind on those grain kernels that's affecting my efficiency data. And so if I can tighten up that process a little bit to eliminate some of that noise, and maybe maybe I just need to, maybe I need to do my no sparge at a consistent temperature. I'm not sure, but I need to try to figure out a way to tighten that up. Some other trials to conduct in addition to the ones I've already mentioned. Um, Expand the range of pH tested, because we saw in the graph how if you got the pH too low, your attenuation fell off a cliff, but I never had pH that was too high. And I think that's because I'm using RO water, so it's hard for me to get enough alkalinity, but I can just dump more baking soda in it and push that pH higher and see if I can get that nice, that parabola-shaped curve that shows on the high end and the low end, the pH falling off, or the attenuation falling off. Uh, some diastatic power trials, I would love to try this with other kinds of malt as well, using some different base malts, like some six row in addition to some crystal to see maybe if you're using crystal, how much six row do you need to use to compensate for the lack of diastatic power in the crystal? Uh, because that's a way that you could maybe achieve the same thing in less time. And then try to extend, as I mentioned before, that crystal malt trial, do like an overnight to see if I can get that line almost flat. But really the only limit here is your imagination and to some extent how much time you have you know, each one of these trials, by the time I mill the grain and weigh everything a gazillion times and throw it in and then wait for the mash and then take it out, cool it and do my measurements and then ferment it and then do my measurements and then clean the, it's, you know, it's five hours probably of quote unquote labor. Um, so it's not nothing, but that five hours gets me eight mashes and a brew day is like five hours. That gets me one mash. So it's still a lot quicker and cheaper than doing a full brew and you can learn a lot more a lot faster this way. Big picture takeaways, I want you to come out of here understanding that mashing can be as simple as you want it to be, just add warm water and grain, but it also is a very complex and multivariate process. There are a lot of biochemical reactions happening. So the more you can abstract this and you can think about sort of the beta amylase range, the alpha amylase range, have an intuitive understanding how beta works and how alpha works, so you get some expectations for how going in different ranges may change things. Also understand there's no sim single optimal mash profile. Can't walk out of here and tell you the best mash to do is 148 degrees Fahrenheit for 75 minutes at a 5.45 PA. I mean, that doesn't make any sense because it depends on what you're trying to achieve. It depends on what attenuation you're trying to get. And then there's downstream effects of your pH that you may want to take into consideration. And you may not be the one who sets your mill gap. So the store sets that and you may have to compensate in others. Just understand that there's a lot of knobs you can turn, and some of them counteract one another, but as a brewer, that gives you more flexibility. Um, don't think of it as a challenge, think of it as it gives you more control points, more flexibility. Uh, and what constraints and conditions? Maybe you have a short brew day, you only got 45 minutes for your mash because you've got to go do something important at the end of your brew day, so maybe that's the day that you want to, you know, a beer that you normally would do at 145, maybe now you want to do at 149 so that mash can happen a little bit faster. Um, or maybe you want to change the pH or add more six row or whatever it is to get the same thing in a shorter amount of time. Um, as I just mentioned, having multiple control points gives you control and flexibility as long as you understand how to use them. Uh, you can use one control point to compensate for constraints on another. Like if you have a, that should be constraints, not constraints. Uh, if you have like a short brew day or maybe because of the grain you're using, it's going to push your pH in a certain direction. You compensate by turning another knob. And also better intuition can help us correct on the fly. Maybe you dough in and you just missed your temperature. You were expecting 148 and it doughed in at 153. And then you're thinking, oh goodness, like what am I gonna do? I gotta try to compensate for this. 
I mean, well, obviously you could try to get that temperature down quickly, but maybe you could extend the time. Maybe you can add some acid and adjust the pH. Maybe there's other things you can do to save that and still get what you were trying to achieve. But lastly, but not leastly, don't be afraid to experiment. All of this is stuff. One of the cool things about home brewing is we have the ability, you know, if you have a sous vide at home or whatever they cost these days, like a hundred something bucks, pick one up and you can do all these experiments on your own at home, just the same as a pro would be doing in a lab. So thank you for your attention. I'm at 58 minutes, which means we have a minute and 15 seconds for questions. Uh, no, it really means I need, to just, I need to shave like eight minutes off of this. Uh, but thank you. Big thank you to White Labs and Eric Fowler, who donated the yeast. And yeah, for you guys who held your questions, if you have any, I'm happy to answer them. Justin. I didn't use any hops because I'm not making beer. I was making words. And uh, before anybody asked, I did taste some of it. It tastes awful. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons it tastes so awful is because if you saw the, the Erlenmeyer flask, I was fermenting and there's a lot of headspace. They got oxidized real bad. That's my other theory as to why that, by the way, that crisp composition, the one that was the shorter, the 60 minute hold had worse attenuation than the 150 minute hold. I waited like five days instead of three days on that one before I did the final gravity measurements. And the, the beers were all gray by the time they were so oxidized because uh, I just had those foam stoppers on the top. And I, I tried to do a little research online to see if oxidation changes gravity and I couldn't find anything that said it did. So I kind of threw that working theory out, but it's possible if the oxidation impacted the gravity. Chris. So there was no boil? No was boil. It? Okay, yeah. So this is another thing. Um, I actually, you know, I'm already eight and a half minutes over. This was another thing when I was doing my process. So when I first envisioned this, there was a boil. And then it, the boil became very hard to control. It became very hard because I don't have like a hot plate that was electric that I could put these flasks on. And certainly not that I could put eight of them on at the same time. And so I was trying to do them stovetop and I ended up with very different evaporation rates, which then changes your gravity, which screws up your whole, your whole bag. So I was, I kind of panicked about this for a couple days. I was like, man, if I can't do a boil, this is going to be screwed up because now microbes can get in there and then I started doing some research on um, pasteurization and I added a mash out step. I didn't tell you this, but I did a mash out step on all of these. So every one of these mashes, I raised it to 170 and held it for 20 minutes. And it turns out that at like at 170, the pasteurization time is like four minutes. So these all should have been pasteurized during that mash out step. And I didn't notice any, and even the one that I let sit for five days before I measured it, no signs of bacterial infection. I saw no little white stuff. Uh, when I tasted them, I didn't get any acidity. The pHs, I didn't, I measured the pH both before and after fermentation. I didn't show you that because it's not really important, but I measured it to make sure consistency and they were all very consistent. These were all finishing right around 4.2 pH. So again, no major pH drop. So I think that pasteurization step is working. And that was a, another, I didn't get into it in the design, but that was another breakthrough that I should, I should devote like 20 seconds when I'm going through it to mention that I did that mash out. Yeah, okay. Because alpha amylase creates glucose, mal like maltose, sucrose, and other sugars, should you focus on um, with your with your mesh? Should you focus on getting all of your alpha am amylase instead of your beta amylase because they go and they um, go and extract more different sugars from your grain? Yeah. So if you want to get whoa, this one's really different. Um, I guess I was dying on that one because there was a while I wasn't hearing myself. If you want to get more different sugars, and I'll just call this like diversity of sugars, alpha amylase is going to give you more diversity of sugars. But you need to understand that diversity of sugars is going to include more maltotriose and more dextrins, which are not going to be fermentable. So an alpha heavy mash will give you more diverse set of sugars, which is what you want if you want a less attenuable beer. So if you're making an English barley wine or you're making something where you want a higher final gravity, that's the way to do it. And also maybe, look, maybe you got one of these time constraints. There's a, a friend of mine in the Quaff Homebrew Club who has small kids and he likes to split his brew days where he'll do the mash one day and then let it sit overnight. And then he comes back the next day and does the boil because it's just hard for him to get five hours with little ones running around where he can do the whole thing in one shot. Well, if you're sitting down in beta amylase range and you do that, all your beer is going to be super attenuated. 
right? It's going to be super attainable. It's going to be really dry. And Eli makes really dry beers when he wants to. But if you don't want to make something that's that dry, you could mash it at that higher temp and let it sit overnight. And it's still, because that alpha amylase, the beta amylase is going to be denatured fairly quickly at those temperatures. The alpha is still going to give you enough diversity of sugars. You can still have a sweet finishing beer um, if your constraint was you had to mash overnight. So that's, an, that's another sort of example of how if you have intuition around this, they can help you sort of work around constraints or problems that you may encounter. Sean. Did you look into uh, just doing like a range, I guess, uh, of temperatures during like a one mash, like a single mash? So staying at like uh, alpha beta, or sorry, beta amylase and then going to alpha amylase? So I didn't do any step mashing, if that's what you mean. The only step that I did was on each of these, I did a, a steady raise to a mash out. So all of these at the end of the mash, the raise ranged between eight and 13 minutes. And that time I logged it for everything. It depended essentially on how much water was in the sous vide and also what, if I was going from 143 to 170 or going from 153 to 170. Um, but it was fairly quick in all cases, between eight and 13 minutes. I didn't do any step mashing, but with this setup, you absolutely could. And for me personally, with the Herm system, and I do a lot of German lagers with step mashes, that's something I want to look at in the future, is if you start, you know, as a step masher, you can manipulate proteins because you can be down in doing a proteinase or, you know, the proteolytic enzymes down below 130 Fahrenheit. But as a benchtop scientist, I don't have any way to measure those proteins. So those experiments were not something where I could sort of, and you know, you say, well, it's gonna change your head or it's gonna change your mouth feel, but there's not a way for me to quantify that. So that's one reason I didn't look at it is because even though I do think as a brewer it matters, I didn't have a way to quantify it as a home, you know, without a fancy analyzing machine that would look and tell me what the protein content was. But you could totally do those experiments if you wanted to, and you could at least see attenuation and efficiency on various step mash profiles. So it's another bunch of complexity, right? Because each of those steps can be a different temp, a different time, you know, it becomes very infinite number of possibilities very quickly, um, but absolutely something you could do with this setup. And you could do it with the thermos setup, you would just have to add water, right? You'd have to manipulate your temperature by adding like boiling water to step it up, uh, the way that people do with like an igloo cooler. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. And I don't know if it... Did the beer go around? Yeah, it went around. The, yeah. the blue one, too? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, that Vienna lager that passed around was a Vienna lager that I brewed back in February. Um, pretty standard Vienna lager. Hope you liked it. Also, hope to see all y'all at Home Brew Con. Whether you come to the seminar or not, you've already seen 80% of it. <laughs> It'll be eight minutes shorter next time with a little bit more data, um, but you should definitely come. It's a ton of fun. You're gonna have a blast at club night. You're gonna have a blast the whole three day weekend, so. Cool, thank you, Doug. Do another round of applause for Doug.